Greetings and salutations, my fellow math enthusiasts and students of all things mathematical. My name is Sean Spartan, and this video will be about the difference between cardinal and ordinal numbers, and also how we can extend our definitions of addition and multiplication to include the transfinite numbers. So let's dive right in. When I say transfinite numbers, I'm referring to numbers that are not finite, which are often referred to as infinities. I say infinities plural because there are more than one, and in fact, there is no highest infinity. For information on this topic, see my video on Cantor's theorem. Leak will be in the description. Contrary to what you may have been taught in school, we can perform arithmetic on infinity. But to do that, we need to re-examine our concept of numbers and carefully extend our notions of addition and multiplication. To not only perform these operations on transfinite numbers, but we have to be careful that any new operations still agree when applied to finite numbers as well. In other words, if we define a new addition, then 2 plus 2 still had better be equal to 4. Let's begin by closely examining our concept of number, and specifically the counting numbers 1, 2, 3, and so on. These numbers are frequently called the natural numbers and are usually denoted with an N. I've talked about this set of numbers frequently in other videos, but in this video we will be discussing how N is actually a subset of two larger classes of numbers, the cardinals, sometimes denoted by the Hebrew letter Tav or simply card, and the ordinals, sometimes denoted by the Greek capital letter Omega or simply Ord. Now you may be wondering why I didn't refer to card or Ord as sets. That's because they cannot have a cardinality and are therefore proper classes of objects. I hope to discuss this topic more in a future video on NBG set theory, so if you're interested, it's coming. Now the cardinal numbers are used to describe the size of sets. In other words, how big a set is. A set's cardinality can also be used to compare the sizes of different sets. A set A is larger than a set B, if and only if A has greater cardinality than B. This is true for both finite and transfinite cardinalities. Since every set has a cardinality, this is a way we can compare any two sets. We are all familiar with finite cardinals. The cardinality of the empty set is zero, the cardinality of the set containing A, B, and C is three, and in general, the cardinality of any finite set with n elements is just n. But we can extend our idea of cardinality to infinite sets. These are the alephs. The first infinite cardinal is aleph null. This is the cardinality or size of any countably infinite set. Therefore, sets like n, the natural numbers, q, the rational numbers, and a, the algebraic numbers, all have cardinality aleph null. Then we have aleph 1, which is the smallest uncountable cardinal and the infinities keep getting higher from there. Sets like the real and complex numbers have cardinality at least aleph one, although we don't know exactly which aleph it is yet. The conjecture that the cardinality of the real numbers is equal to aleph one is called the continuum hypothesis, and it is one of the greatest unanswered questions in mathematics. The ordinal numbers are not about the size of sets, but how their elements are arranged. Now, for finite ordinals, these match up with the finite cardinals. If I have a set containing five elements and I order them one, two, three, four, five, then five is the fifth element and the size of the set is also five. If I add an element to that set, let's say six, then that new element is the sixth ordinal and the size of my new set also increases to six. This is not necessarily true for infinite sets. If I add one to an infinite set, I am not increasing its size. It's still infinite. At this point, I am going to introduce the first transfinite ordinal, omega. Omega is the first number that comes after the natural numbers. So basically, after all the counting numbers are counted, omega comes next, followed by omega plus one, omega plus two, and so on. But we just said adding an element to an infinite set doesn't make it any bigger. So the cardinalities would remain the same. In other words, the ordinals from one to omega have cardinality aleph null as do the ordinals from one to omega plus one. The important thing to remember is that omega plus one is not bigger than omega, it just comes after omega. So what happens when we're done counting up all the countable ordinals? Omega, omega plus one, omega plus omega, omega squared, omega to the omega power, etc. 
Well, since all of the countable ordinals are used up, we have to introduce what's called a new order type, which in this case is omega 1. So omega 1 is the first uncountable ordinal. Then comes omega 2, omega 3, and so on. So for transfinite numbers, the cardinals line up with the ordinals that represent new order types. So in general, if I have a collection of ordinals with a given order type n, then the size of that collection corresponds to the cardinal number aleph n. So there still is a relationship between the cardinals and ordinals. There's basically just more going on in the ordinals. Now that we've discussed the differences between cardinal and ordinal numbers, I'll now talk about cardinal arithmetic. We need to find a way to extend the operations of addition and multiplication of finite numbers so that they, one, include all of the cardinal numbers, not just the finite ones, and two, this new arithmetic should work the same for finite numbers as well. In other words, two plus two should still be four, and five times two should still be 10. Since cardinality is a measure of a set size, we'll make our new definitions in terms of sets. Let's start with addition. Given two cardinal numbers, alpha and beta, let's consider two sets A and B, such that A has cardinality alpha and B has cardinality beta. Now, if they share no elements in common, in other words, if A intersect B is zero, then the cardinality of their union is equal to the sum of their cardinalities, which is alpha plus beta. So it's tempting to define the sum of alpha plus beta as the cardinality of A union B, but their intersection has to be empty. To ensure this, we'll do a trick. We will cross the elements of A with zero and cross the elements of B with one. And we'll take the union of A cross zero and B cross one. This will ensure that the intersection is indeed empty. Now before we get too excited, let's make sure our new notion of addition works for the finite numbers as well. Let's do two plus three. So I have the set one, two as my A and the set 1, 2, 3 as my set B. Then using our new definition for addition, I have 2 plus 3 equals the cardinality of the set A union B, which is 1, 0, 2, 0, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, which has five distinct elements. Therefore, 2 plus 3 equals 5, which is what we'd expect. In fact, it's not hard to show that for any two finite whole numbers M and N, when you apply our new definition of addition, you get the same m plus n that you'd expect. Let's take a look at some examples of sums involving transfinite numbers. Aleph null plus one. Now I can use our definition in the strict sense, or I can use any two sets for my a and b that I know for sure have no intersection. And to make things easier, that's what I'm gonna do. To compute aleph null plus one, note that n is a set of size aleph null, and zero is a set of size one. Therefore, aleph null plus one is equal to the cardinality of n with zero included. But this is just the cardinality of n since I can add one to each of these numbers and I get the set n without changing its size. And we know the cardinality of n is aleph null. Therefore, aleph null plus one is equal to aleph null. And in fact, for any finite n, aleph null plus n is aleph null since this operation is associative and I can just add one to aleph null n times. What about aleph null plus aleph null? This time I'll choose n for both a and b. Then n cross zero union n cross one can be written in this way to show that the union is listable. Any infinite set that can be listed or counted has cardinality aleph null. Therefore, aleph null plus aleph null is equal to aleph null. This means that for any finite whole number n, n times aleph null, which is just adding aleph null n times, is going to be equal to aleph null. What about infinities larger than aleph null? How do we perform addition on them? Well, when we add two alephs together, either they're both the same size, in which case doubling will not make the set any larger, or one aleph will be bigger than the other and will dominate because it corresponds to a higher order type. So for any two infinite cardinals, aleph m and aleph n, aleph m plus aleph n is going to be the maximum of the two. Now let's take a look at multiplication. 
We've already been able to calculate the products like aleph null times n, where m is finite. But what about products like aleph null times aleph null? What about aleph m times aleph n? What about powers of an aleph? For multiplication, we're going to keep the same setup we had for addition. Namely, we have two cardinal numbers, alpha and beta, along with two sets A and B, such that the cardinality of A is alpha and the cardinality of B is beta. Then alpha times beta is going to be the cardinality of the Cartesian product of A and B. Unlike with addition, it doesn't matter if our sets are disjoint. Let's look at some examples. First of all, we need to make sure that this definition works for finite numbers as well. Let's say that A is the set 1, 2, 3, 4, and B is the set 1, 2. And we want to use that to calculate 4 times 2. By our new definition, that would be the cardinality of the Cartesian product of the two sets, which is 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4, 2, which is 8. So by our new multiplication, 2 times 4 equals 8 which is what we want. In fact, it is not hard to show that for any finite counting numbers m and n, our definition of multiplication yields the same result of n times n that you would expect. How about a finite number n times aleph null? Now we could calculate this product using our new multiplication, but actually it's not necessary. We have already shown using repeated application of our new addition that n times aleph null is aleph null. So how about aleph null times aleph null? I'm going to assume sets A and B are both countably infinite. Then the Cartesian product is also countably infinite. This means that aleph null times aleph null is just aleph null. In fact, by a similar argument as we used before, if either alpha or beta are infinite, then alpha times beta is just the maximum of the two. I'm not going to go into cardinal exponentiation too much because it goes into some concepts that are beyond the scope of this video, but we can infer some properties of cardinal exponentiation just by using what we've already learned. We know that aleph null times aleph null is equal to aleph null. Therefore, for any finite positive integer n, we have aleph null to the nth power is equal to aleph null. Also, if m and n are both finite and lambda is infinite, then m to the lambda equals n to the lambda, and specifically that means that this equals 2 to the lambda. Now this is the cardinality of the power set of any set A whose cardinality is lambda. That's it. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. If you have any questions or suggestions for future videos, please leave me a comment.